It makes sense for me to finally tackle the classic Exorcist. Maybe now the rip-off eerie midnight horror show will make sense to me 15 years after I reviewed it. Plus, there's a new Exorcist movie coming out, and that also makes sense. Lori Strode came back for Halloween 2018. The Sally character in Texas Netflix Massacre. Kenny Loggins in Top Gun Maverick. So sure, Chris is back in the new Exorcist. Wake me when this guy returns. I'm very serious about bringing back that guy. When I wrote the joke, I just skipped ahead to find the first extra I could see. The Exorcist was based on the 1971 novel by William Peter Blatty. I can identify with this. I'm also in the phase of showing sonogram pictures to strangers. It's the harrowing tale of why you do not get your children wet, put them in the sun, or feed them after midnight. Blatty partly based his book on the 1949 Roland Doe exorcism. And after the book sold well after his appearance on The Dick Cavett Show, he was very interested in getting it adapted into a movie on the grounds that he would also produce. He also wrote the screenplay, which sticks pretty close to the book, while making it more focused for a film and the length of time condensed. The diarrhea scenes were removed, though, but that's okay. I'm sure they put them back in Scary Movie 2. Directors like Stanley Kubrick were approached, and John Borman hated it and turned it down. Well, that'll work itself out. But Blatty insisted on William Friedkin as director after being a huge fan of The French Connection. French Connection DP Owen Roisman also shot this film, too. And long story short, it was the first horror film to be up for Best Picture, the highest-grossing R-rated horror film until It, and still Warner's most successful film adjusted for inflation and is required viewing before you watch Repossessed. Considered to be one of the greatest horror films ever made, unless you're the type who unprovoked says, Actually, I think the movie is funny. Oh my god, you are so cute. Personally, this movie scares the shit out of me, so I will also make sure the diarrhea from the book is at least in the review, too. I also had this for lunch. We've got to give the movie a second. If the Warner Brothers logo turns to ice, then we'll know it's Batman and Robin. Honest mistake. Okay, we have the iconic title sequence by Dan Perry, hired for his impressive work on the Electra Glide and Blue titles. Nowadays, we just get this font in any movie that wants to look like something from the 70s, but is probably a colossal disappointment. Here, the music will tell us where it's taking place. That's how you know it's in Nebraska. Immediately, this takes us all back to renting it for the first time and wondering, oh, wait, uh, I rented the right movie, didn't I? It was very easy back then to accidentally come home with a copy of King Solomon's Mines. The opening is set in northern Iraq, actually filmed in Iraq, where they had to take an all-British crew with them due to no diplomatic relations with the U.S. No time for that now. If we keep digging enough, we'll find the doorway to hell. It's gotta be down there somewhere. This is a fantastic campaign ad showcasing Jimmy Carter's wonderful charity work in multiple countries. Here we meet Max von Sydow as Father Marin, wondering if he's in the Paul Schrader universe or the Rennie Harlan universe. Sydow was only 44 at the time, but the makeup by Dick Smith is considered to be some of the most convincing aging makeup put on film. That's old school. Nowadays, de-aging is the thing. If they have to de-age Chris in the new one, I'm sure it'll probably look like this. And really, most 44-year-olds in the 70s looked this old. Ah, there it is, my medallion of St. Joseph. <laughs> then, coincidentally, a million bees swarm out of his guide's ass. It's a stressful trip. The water is finally getting to him. And sure, the presence of evil. That's nothing a shot of wild turkey can't fix. Now, where's those pancakes? Excellent. Almost flattened out entirely, boss. 
It's good of Marin to pass his good fortune off to the next person. He's tired of waking up with a pillow full of locusts. He really doesn't want to think that somewhere right now, maybe not in this film, but James Earl Jones is dressed in this costume. This place is far too dangerous. <laughs> The devil removed all the crosswalk signs. Before Marin goes home, he must say goodbye to this land that he's gotten to know so well. When the sun sets over the statue of the demon Pazuzu? That's where we leave this opening sequence on this very chilling image of Marin coming face to face with evil for the first time in the film, certainly part of a bookend. Wait, we're leaving? I hadn't gotten to a Raiders of the Lost Ark reference! Do you know how hard that was? While a lot of interiors were shot in New York, plenty of exteriors were filmed on location in Georgetown, where Ellen Burstyn plays actress Chris McNeil, cast in a lead role in, uh, I don't know, uh, something called Beyond the Door? Sounds kind of silly. She's concerned about all the suspicious noises. Huh, could be worse. Could be colder than a freezer where she's doing unspeakable things with a crucifix. I'm gonna be up for a while. Fix me my midnight snack of ribeye and a Swiss omelet. Then I'll go back to sleep. Now is where we think, damn, did I also rent the making of documentary? I didn't even know our video store had that. Look, there's William Peter Blatty arguing with Jack McGowan, the director within the film. He studied hard for this role. He and Friedkin had several arguments as well, to put it lightly. Chris is very concerned about the curse of the film. Can't be worse than The Exorcist curse where there were lasting injuries to the cast, damages to the sets and circuit breakers, sudden deaths of actors and family members, like McGowan, who died a week after completing his scenes, and Vasiliki Malaros died before the movie was released. But back to the making of the movie within the movie, where Macro from Caligula is ready for the head-chopping scene. I'm curious about this fake movie. It's like Dangerous Minds, only about demanding better snack machines in the study hall. I know where this is gonna end. She's gonna inspire someone to play football or something. I'm out. That's where we meet Jason Miller as Father Karras, and also the character of Tubular Bells. The director wanted minimal music for the film, which does make it more unsettling when Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells comes in, and the rest of the soundtrack by Jack Nish, intended to come in only every now and then to make the hairs stand up on the back of your head. It's funny, I first remember tubular bells being used when Gary and Wyatt wake up in weird science. But you know what happens. You start playing some bells, and eventually you come across two concerned priests. What if we actually make a girl, like Frankenstein, except cuter? I still want to know about Chris's movie, though. It's kind of like the uh, Walt Disney version of the Ho Chi Minh story, but other than that, it was terrific. That's exactly how they sold Pollyanna. Reagan seems nice enough, completely normal, hanging out with her friends, having a great day, no head spinning. Many parents wanted their actor kids kept far away from the movie due to its content. Hell, Violet from Willy Wonka was considered, but the family found it too dark. Oh, I mean, not by much. Linda Blair then gained the attention of the filmmakers when she came in with her mother, Eleanor Blair, and instantly does a brilliant job just seeming like a normal kid with completely natural delivery. And these scenes are the light-hearted Blair moments before the awesomeness of street gang and women in prison films of the 80s. Also masterpieces, I will not hear otherwise. One thing that is still just as gritty in the 70s, the subway system. Either you go that way and Joe Spinell is chasing a nurse, or this way and Paul Kersey is getting mugged. Makes sense, frequent Bronson collaborator J. Lee Thompson was considered to play Dennings. Bronson never had to face off against outer and inner demons. Karis lives in an appropriate place. All you need is a cross, some books, and a bottle of booze before going home to visit your brother Tony Monero. At one point, Jack Nicholson was considered for this role till they were like, oh no, looks too unholy. 
So Friedkin was much more interested in stage actor and playwright Jason Miller, who had a past in Catholic education, and he himself went through a spiritual crisis when studying at a Catholic university. Dude was born to play this role. Just by looks alone, he looks like you typed in 70s priest into starry AI. He's got troubles of his own. His own son is suffering some kind of vampire-like curse. These kids always getting in trouble. Playing with dolls in a basement and ping pong tables is a slippery slope to playing with the phone line directly to Satan. Have you seen every Satanic Panic special ever made? Well, let's both play that. Okay, on second thought, let's play Battleship. She's been talking to some kind of figure named Captain Howdy. I don't know what that is, but I'm instantly picturing D. Snyder. A lot of notable names were also interested in the role of Chris, including Shirley MacLaine, who was a friend of Blatty's, but she was turned down due to being in a similar film, The Possession of Joel Delaney. But Blatty and Friedkin did want to cast people who were more so unknowns back then, although they did like Carol Burnett for the role, to show she could play against tight, but the studio rejected it. Ellen Burstyn was also perfect casting, considering she also had a Catholic upbringing, which she left. Hell, in scenes like this, if you take out the demon possession, it could have been a Marsha Mason film if Neil Simon wrote it. Some things come back to me when watching it. I forgot Ramblin' Man by the Allman Brothers Band was on the soundtrack. Why do I have a hunch the new one will play Ramblin' Man in the end credits? Like it's the series Don't Fear the Reaper. This is like a J. Lee Thompson cop film. He's burnt out, sick of the job, he can't cut it, and he's losing his faith. Lots of foreshadowing here. Reagan will definitely pick up bad language from hearing her mom scream on the phone about her father not showing up. It's okay. She'll get a call in the middle of the night next to her giant photo of Dana Barron from vacation. She's still under the assumption it's rats making noises. Normally I'd laugh, but trust me, rat people can absolutely get this loud. She's been meaning to search around for Victor Frankenstein's library anyway. She'll find out if there's rats roaming around. <laughs> well, there's definitely a gas leak. Let's take a break. Already this movie needs to get its ass to church. Who are you? Beyond the door. Beyond the door. Step inside. <laughs> We're back and ugh, I found these on the streets. I'll just put them on a grave. Any grave. Doesn't really matter. I'm not sure if I can show you the vandalism which took place here, but it was definitely those rowdy college punk extras. Wondering if you can show something sums up a lot of reviewing The Exorcist. I've asked that far more here than I would ask if I was reviewing Strokemon. But I can show Father Karras going to the set of Cuckoo's Nest to rub it in Jack's face. Ladies, ladies, damn it! For the last time, I'm not Johnny Cash! Calm yourself, women! You can give me a call when you get out. Mother wonders why he's leaving her there. His name is Damien Karras. He's supposed to be the good Damien! We'll get to the other more troubled Damien later. He's got to prepare for if it does turn into an 80s action movie. There is a training montage. He's going to beat the shit out of that demon and end the Cold War at the same time. It is still the 70s, though, so it's the third dinner party of the week. Everyone is invited. William Holden, John Hurt, Liza Minnelli, and if you invite the priest, there will definitely be smoking indoors. Exposition is on the menu, too. She finds out about Karis being a spiritual psychiatrist and also that his mother just died. That ain't too awkward of a conversation. Wait until Burke Dennings gets drunk. Bloody damn butchering Nazi pig. He also said the same thing to the clown blowing up the balloon animals. Let's get you to the after party. We're on our way to the nearest biker bar. <laughs> That'll go over well. Losing one drunk man ain't gonna put a damper on this party. We got more than enough booze and singing on the piano. Woohoo! Sing Statesboro Blues! Reagan, join in!
You're gonna die up there. She's more of a fan of Stormy Monday by the Allman Brothers. Do we do we hit her on the nose with a rolled up magazine? That's still nothing. Dennings peed on far more carpets in the place without anyone noticing. We've got 70s doctors to handle this. It's nerves, and that's all. You just take your pills and you'll be fine, really. But how is vodka and Valium supposed to help with this, Mother? On the plus side... Is it coming out, Willie? Yes? The maid got a raise and learned some lessons the hard way. <laughs> Like never buying a used bed from the Motel 6. It's disturbing enough as it is because it looks real. And she really was injured during one of the rocking bed scenes due to being loosely strapped to it. This is like the ultimate Catholic guilt film. That's how you get more drinking and smoking than in Barfly. The dude says, I don't know about this drinking. And it's like, oh, what do you mean? Without the drinking, why would I be a priest? Even in his dreams, he gets haunting images of his mother, who if she's in hell, I don't know, could be the Estes Perkle hell, except way creepier when these images are just flashed at you. Plus, at least he's getting some sleep, unlike... Honey, it's the hell! No! Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no! Reagan is one of those patients. Look, ma'am, have you tried cigarettes? I don't mean for the girl, I mean for us. And also, yes, I do mean for the girl. It might, however, cause night sweats and bed shakes. I got on the bed, the whole bed was thumping and rising off the floor and shaking. Okay, here's some complimentary Ritalin. Even this scene is controversial, and not because the technician, Paul Bateson, was later convicted of murder, with theories even linking him to a string of murders involving gay men, which led Friedkin to make Cruising. No, it was mainly controversial at the time due to it being a very realistic angiogram scene, which caused a lot of discomfort to the 1973 audience. It shows the innocence of the character meeting medical science. And the movie was already known for causing nausea, vomiting, and fainting for audience members. With no barf bags given out, they'll just have to borrow the ones from the Mark of the Devil Theater. It's the simple uses of noises from the machinery and the matter-of-factness of it that does make it unsettling. And like a genuine flow and bridge between how we met this character and what starts happening after. Movies like this aren't difficult to review, but even after 50 years, it's still so powerful that I just end up watching the movie when I should be taking notes. It's burning! It's burning! There's something there! Please help her! Note number 230. React to the camera by shouting, oh, Jesus Christ! Not sure how much dialogue I can show, but I can give a shout out to Mercedes McCambridge, who did the possessed voice for Reagan after, no joke, a nice diet of raw eggs and chain smoking. They say that the fact that she was dubbed in these scenes hurt her chances of winning the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress, which she was nominated for, but this is still one hell of a performance, just in a physical sense alone. And all the demon stuff will have a simple explanation. We still think that the temporal lobe... Oh, what are you talking about, for Christ's sakes? Okay, ma'am, if you want, we can check the internet. There's a chance it could be due to microchips. We'll consult right away with Dr. Patriot. Or maybe something else was involved. You keep any drugs in your house? No. Of course not, you idiot. Just quaaludes and Thorazine. Plus, I talked to one of my actor friends and removed all the wire hangers. The setting itself gets far more sinister and bleak on just the ride home. A far cry from the nice tubular walk she had earlier. And the room is colder and darker, where it really was this cold so they actually could see the actor's breath. I need a pick-me-up. Get Burke in here with one of his drunken sailor tunes. Burke's dead. He must have been drunk. He fell down from the top of the steps right outside. Don't bother telling me where. I already know the steps. J. Lee Thompson can now take over, and there will be far more bazookas in the fake film. And there's a psychiatrist and hypnotist, so it's going the Ron Ormond, please don't touch me route. Point me to the Walgreens with the most expensive e-meter they have before this session escalates quickly. <laughs> 
rookie mistake. Always wear a cup when hypnotizing. Why do you think Karras is still on hour three of his training montage? Lee J. Cobb as Lieutenant Kinderman had to come to him before he himself gets possessed and turned into George C. Scott. Karras, I finally found you. What's this all about? Yeah, it's true, you do look like a boxer. That's why he first approached Spider Rico, assuming it was Karras. Kinderman is investigating Burke's death and its ties to witchcraft and the desecration of the church. Burke Dennings was found at the bottom of those steps with his head turned completely around. I know just who to talk to. The special effects supervisor, Marcel Versatier. We'll be right back. If we're gonna play tennis, I'm gonna need the right shoes. I'll get my ass handed to me in these loafers. And if you want the perfect neck support for those nights where your head spins 360 degrees and something that can soak up all of that middle of the night pea soup drooling, why not do it on my face with the Cinema Snob Daki Makura pillowcase? That's right, from our friends at Loading Crew Crafts, you can get your Cinema Snob pillowcase today. Let my sexy voice and face soothe you to sleep for a good night's rest. Get yours today at LoadingCrewCrafts.com or click on the link in the comments and in the description. We're back and there's no need for me to talk about movies when the film itself is a huge movie fan. You like movies? Well, I get passes to the best shows in town. Oh, we're gonna see The Werewolf of Washington. It's on a double feature with cannibal girls. It's got farmhouses, chicks, and cannibals. You're gonna love it, Father. Oh, no thank you, Detective. I'll watch the review online. That's where he can hear audio from other movies placed over this movie. Case in point, Reagan flipping out during testing. It gets up and kills. The people it kills get up and kill. After that expert put in his two cents, this is a real Really, really awkward time to ask Chris for an autograph. Oh, we're not sure what movies she's been in, so let's assume she's also in Werewolf of Washington. I can tell the experts are getting a little desperate with their suggestions. Have you ever heard of exorcism? Oh, so that's what the title means. No joke, Warner considered changing the title after people surveyed didn't know what an exorcist was. You can't do that, then what the hell are they gonna call the sexorcist? What would they have replaced the exorcist with? You're telling me that I should take my daughter to a witch doctor. Hmm, sure, but not one of Robert Mitchum's more well-known 50s films. There's a lot of detective work going on here. Even back then, we were all visiting the steps from the exorcist to take a selfie. If you look closely, there may still be props on the ground. This was found in Burke's ass. Weirdly, it was there days before he fell out the window. Even Chris is investigating who put the crucifix under Reagan's pillow. But hey, if it works, why not? Hell, it's 1973. Jesus Christ Superstar should be playing in theaters. Ask Kinderman to use some of his tickets to see that picture. Speak of the devil, Kinderman is still here in his procedural TV pilot to solve Denning's death. Or something. Do you mind? That's really distracting. I've seen enough hypnotism in the past few weeks. Personally, I think the detective can solve all of her problems. Watch out for drafts. A draft in the fall when the house is hot. See, Reagan just has a bit of a cold. So Dennings fell from Reagan's window, or may have been pushed. Look, just go ahead and arrest Carl. Burke used to call him a Nazi, and he did leave a copy of Ilsa She-Wolf of the SS under Reagan's pillow. The lieutenant is excellent at picking up signals. Would you like some more coffee? Please. Okay, that was the definition of an empty offer, but stick around if you like. Just why was this drunken-ass director hanging out in her daughter's room? If certain British doctors never asked what is this fungus, we wouldn't today have penicillin. I'm just saying, solving Burke's death will cure cancer. At least here, we finally know the name of one of her movies. Oh, well, you know that film you made, um, Angel. I knew it! The hard-ass house mother thumbing her nose at the school girls working on the streets. Though Kinderman isn't the best with timing, if he had stuck around a few more seconds, he'd get one of the scariest scenes in the film. Between the stabbing sound with the crucifix, the wind, 
the voice. It is horrifying in a way that's like, I can't believe they could show this. And a lot of critics thought that too, as they wondered if Warner pulled some strings to get the MPAA to bring it down from an X to an R so it could get more screens and better advertising. Making it even more unsettling is that there's no music in the scene, and it's the one-two punch of the crucifix part and the head-spinning part all in the same scene, which Blatty was originally against, stating that the head-spinning would be too impossible to happen, but it works. Not to mention the colorful vulgarities. Don't know how much I can play, so instead let's go to the version you don't want to see, with Clubber Lang doing the voice. I will destroy any man who tries to take what I got. I'm gonna torture him. I'm gonna crucify him real bad. That does it. I need a priest right away. I'm putting her up for adoption. Have you got a cigarette, Father? Oh. Uh, does the Pope smoke in the woods? <laughs> Sorry, a little Catholic humor there. I'm getting the feeling that even the priest survey didn't know what an exorcism was. How do you go about getting an exorcism? I beg your pardon? Sure, exorcisms were rare before the movie's release, but they skyrocketed after, with people suddenly thinking that others were possessed. Damn you, demon-possessed hippies! It takes an emotional toll on the audience, too, as it's a freaky-ass movie, but also genuinely sad with how broken and desperate her mom gets over the course of the movie. And it's gonna get awfully intense in there because of the filmmakers. Friedkin at one point fired a gun with blanks to startle Miller for a reaction, and in the famous vomit scene, he told them the pea soup would hit him in the chest, so when it hit him in the face, he got a genuine reaction. Enough trivia though, you're really here for the Rocky quotes. I'll bust you up. Go for it. While Chris is never offering coffee again, it was still nice of her to wash his clothes. Uh, these smell nice now, but, oh god, I can still taste the pea soup in my mouth. Ugh, why couldn't she have vomited something I like, like clam chowder? He still needs more evidence. Damn it, if only this was the extended version with the crab walk scene. The original cut of the movie was around 140 minutes, but the studio wanted it tightened, which included nixing a lot of the direct favorite scenes, like the extended ending, which is from the book. Given Friedkin and Blatty not wanting the movie to be trimmed, Friedkin calls the extended cut his version of the film. But we still get Kinderman watching over everyone, desperate to find someone to go see Wuthering Heights with him. Though my favorite reaction in the whole film is Karis's when she opens the drawer. Did you do that? You little scamp. We've already checked. There's no rats here. I like that Pazuzu is clearly a demon, but also a total dramatic bullshitter from claiming to be the devil to reacting violently to the holy water, which turns out was secretly just tap water. Speaking of a drink. Want a drink? Does the Pope drink bourbon in the woods? <laughs> okay, stop that. I'm gonna leave the church twice. If you ask me, the real top priority is Burke Dennings, clearly the Ben Tramer of the series. She killed Burke Dennings. The director of Angel? Who are they gonna get for Angel 2? Karis now needs to get some help sleeping by taking the recordings with him. I am no one. I am no one. <laughs> Well, he instantly deleted that track from the call map. We'll be right back. There's gonna be something terrible in there, like shitting tomato bisque all over the carpet after we just got the urine smell out. He is the essence of the unholy, enemy of the faith, foe to the human race. The tempter, Satan, why do you stand and resist? She is his. Deliver her from evil. The Tempter. Rated R. We're back, people. Boy, am I glad this is a good movie. I needed it. I'm simultaneously watching this film while fighting a copyright strike over, of all things, Little Red Riding Hood and the Monsters. It's like enjoying a five-star steak dinner while fighting food poisoning from weak old macaroni salad from the carnival. Which I have a feeling is what's causing Reagan's stomach problems. Have we tried Tums yet? 
Sometimes it hits me halfway into watching something old where I realize, oh man, I've gotten older than some of the actors from this film. Karis is about seven years younger than me here. Though take away the collar, he dresses like me a bit. He's young enough to where they got to do some more cop movie routines. Bring in the grizzled old vet to help him out on the case. How about Lancaster Marin? Don't you think he's too old, Tuttle? Huh? I know he looks old, but trust us, he's only 44. Look at you and I, we're in our mid-twenties. So Marin accepts the job because he's going to get a really cool shot out of it. And I mean legendary, like a quintessential perfect shot in a film. The one that makes you say, so that's what they were parodying in Master of Disguise. The shot was inspired by the Empire of Lights paintings and was filmed on Cedow's first day on set. Okay, let's wrap up this shot and we're going to Iraq. <laughs> Wait, what? Hopefully nothing else scares him away. <coughs> she must feed. They each give each other plenty of warnings. Now Pazuzu will say terrible things about your mother, like an early 90s rap battle, but please keep your feelings in check, father. And how I've learned to ignore the vile language from the demons in this house. Your, your mother, mother was, was a hamster, hamster and your father, father smelled of elderberries. Who the power of Christ compels you to take a nap! Just one more thing, no matter how much we beg you to bring soap to wash her mouth out, do not open the door! They worked their ass off on this set, making it, like I said, cold as hell, but also using very limited lighting, with no standard movie lighting, to really give it a realistic feel. Even with the disturbing nature of the scene itself, Sida was so shocked by Blair screaming the vulgar lines, he forgot some of his own lines. And who wouldn't with these taunts? You want to come out and close it, Come on! Sure, there's a lot of themes present all throughout the film. Much discussion has been made that the movie possibly symbolizes societal rot, or a reaction against feminism, or youth in revolt. But obviously, it is a criticism of Reagan's drug policy as governor of California. Her name is Reagan. It's been lampooned so many times that even watching it, it's easy to think back to some of the parodies, like the bed falling on Richard Pryor's foot on SNL, The Better Exorcist 2. Nowadays, if you want to know if your child is possessed, you have to look at the 200 Exorcist knockoffs released in a year. If they're popping and locking a lot, or if your child is mostly CGI, they may be possessed. The cinematography is part of what makes this one of the best sequences put on film, and the amazing, unapologetic, colorful language, second only to Bat Pussy in the wild insults. This is either a possession or the single most intricate episode of Fool Pen and Teller. It makes you wonder what the neighbors are thinking during all of this. There's the phenomenal shot of Marin confronting the same evil he encountered at the beginning. Meanwhile, the neighbors are in for a nice night of watching a new episode of Barnaby Jones. A demon is among them, but still, they do need to take a breather. So, uh, did the lieutenant offer you free movie tickets too? Oh uh, yes, uh, we went to go see Live and Let Die. I think I see someone dressed as Baron Samedi in my sleep. They just look like they're contemplating the possibility of what if evil wins. I'd go to the bathroom too and pop a couple of ibuprofen. Karis seems like the kind of person who, regardless of demon possession, would have so much guilt his mother is sitting there judging him. It's shots like this where I'm like, yeah, I can see why they consider Kubrick to direct this. And that is not your mother. It sounds like you're becoming just like your father. Hmm, her heart is pure ice. It could very well be my mother. It was Jason Miller's first role in a movie, and by God, what a hell of an emotional performance this dude packs. A huge talent on stage and screen, he also earned the Oscar nomination he got. Best leave it to Marin, though. He knows what to do. Spray her with good slime. It has a nice bubblegum flavor, not that nasty pea soup. It's how much time we spend invested in these characters and their backstories and the steady pace of the movie that really makes us care instead of doing something simply for the spectacle. 
which is what we see a lot of today. Even with Marin, who we've only seen at the beginning and then at the end, he's such a force on screen that it is shocking to see when he dies. He'll be back in the sequel. And with Reagan sitting there watching, not saying anything, with no noise, shows the subtlety of moments like this, and it's just enough for him to finally snap. Go for the TKO! And uh, you probably will get possessed yourself. <laughs> Karis will also be back in one of the sequels. Alright, you're going downtown. Gonna get my partner Kolchak in here. We'll vacuum out these remaining spirits. Another tidbit of 70s filmmaking, like Father Dyer getting slapped in the face to rattle him up so much that the tears on screen are real. At this point, I wonder if they were like, eh, just jump from the window onto the stairs. We need those bones breaking to sound real. It's right of them to move out of there very quickly before anyone brings one of those light machines to hypnotize Reagan anymore. Also, Chris, you're due back on set. We still have to finish this movie. A lot of people like the ending of The Extended More, which, like I said, is the ending of the book, where the two talk about which movie to go see, and that symbolizes that good has triumphed over evil. But I do love the theatrical ending, where both of the endings show that Reagan says she doesn't remember anything, but subconsciously knows enough to where she recognizes some things. Granted, this is the ending I grew up with, but I like the eerie-ass shot looking at the stairs with the soundtrack playing and not knowing if the evil is gonna come back. And come back it will, they'll franchise the shit out of this! The movie was a phenomenon and had such a cultural impact, it led to more mainstream horror films with bigger budgets and similar themes like The Omen, Burnt Offerings, The Amityville Horror, and a ton of knockoffs. And we got bad sequels, good sequels, competing prequels, a TV series, and a new film in theaters October of 2023. I know it's popular to say, but I don't care. This movie earned its spot as one of the best horror films ever made, and was still chilling even watching it for this review. Almost as chilling as when I watched the movies where E.T. has sex. <laughs> there really is a wide variety of cinema snob episodes nowadays. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs>